And today, my colleagues, Stephen Katz, Susan Morrison, Jacob Benezra, and I will discuss remote advocacy and the age of social distancing. Uh, first off, uh, we all hope that you and your loved ones are healthy and safe. Of course, that's all of our uh, priority right now and, and as it should be. Uh, but there's also uh, the issue that we have to deal with that we're all, uh, where we are attorneys uh, who have obligations to our clients who uh, continue to have needs and have uh, their issues being advocated in the court system. Uh, the courts are open, uh, but things have changed for us, at least for a temporary time. Uh, so in these unprecedented times, a large number of people are currently working remotely. And, uh, and here at, uh, at Fish and, and, and their, our technology vendors, uh, we're experiencing some challenges with that bandwidth. Uh, so I want to talk about a few housekeeping notes first. Uh, please keep your logins handy. And if you lose your connection, please log back in. If we experience any technical issues on our end, you may experience a blank screen for 30 to 40 seconds, uh, but the program should commence again shortly. We ask for your patience. If you experience any technical difficulties using computer audio, please disconnect and re-log in using your phone, making sure to, to enter the access code and audio pen. Uh, please note that this program will likely qualify for CLE in some, but not all jurisdictions. Many state bar CLE offices are currently closed or working with reduced staff, so this may delay the review process. FISH will apply for and issue CLE credit for this program where eligible and applicable. Also, our biographies, the presentation, and the New Jersey, New York blank CLE form are available to download on your control panel. I note that you must be logged in to the webinar on your device in order to receive CLE credit. We're going to announce a code in the middle of the uh, presentation. You will not receive credit for listening to the audio portion only. Uh, today's webinar will run for one hour and include a question and answer period at the end of the program. You may ask questions at that time throughout the program using the question and answer section on your control panel. We'll do our best to answer all the, all the questions at the end of the presentation, time permitting, uh, but also don't hesitate to contact us personally after the webinar if there's any questions you may have. Before we get started, I should remind you that the content of this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of Fish and Richardson. And it's also not intended to address every court or case situation. Uh, so with that, uh, let's begin. Uh, by this point in the uh, current pandemic, uh, almost all in-person hearings and oral arguments have effectively been canceled or postponed. Uh, what we're seeing is that you, the uh, cases have not stopped. Uh, they may have slowed or paused a little bit, but uh, the judiciary is still looking for ways to keep the court system running. And to do that, uh, courts are looking to telephonic hearings and even video conferences as alternatives. Uh, this is not happening without some challenges. Uh, and the uh, a good reason for that is shelter-in-place orders have essentially confined most attorneys and judges and other participants to their home uh, without the kind of IT support that we are all used to in order to conduct uh, remote hearings and remote conferences. So in, in this webinar, we're going to cover a couple proposals to consider, uh, both for courts and attorneys practicing in those courts alike, and we're going to sort through the details of a remote hearing. Uh, first thing we're going to talk about is the cost of remote advocacy. What do we lose when we're not in person? Uh, we're going to talk about some of the components of remote advocacy uh, that, are, that you may or may not realize have been important in how you've approached your behavior and how you approach arguments in the courtroom. Uh, but they're going to become different and are going to affect the way things happen by telephone or by video conference. Uh, then we're going to discuss some best practices uh, that we've come across and that other courts uh, and judges are starting to adopt and uh, help try to help everyone get through this change in, in our working environment. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, first off, uh, we're all in this together. This was a situation that was forced upon us. 
whether it was expected or unexpected, it's here now. And uh, it's not something that we're used to doing in the, uh, in the legal practice as a matter of course. Uh, so we may have done in the past some teleconferences on uh, an occasional hearing, uh, but they've been rare. And uh, some courts almost never do them unless it's an emergency. Uh, but that's going to be the norm, at least for the uh, short, uh, hopefully, time period going forward. Uh, and what that means is that we're all going to have to work together. Uh, the attorneys, uh, the courts, uh, opposing counsel, are all going to have to work together to figure this out because uh, uh, courts have not been set up to simply uh, kick this off and go as though nothing has happened. <clears throat> uh, one of the interesting things uh, that we're dealing with is that courts, for the most part, do not have a well-established IT video conferencing platform to conduct hearings. Uh, what we've seen is that some courts, and this is more true in the state courts, but they've moved quickly to try to adopt something for conducting telephone and video conference hearing. Uh, one uh, example that I've noticed being a, a Texas attorney is that Texas state courts very quickly uh, tested and, and adopted video conferencing. Uh, they've uh, seem to have adopted Zoom as the default platform, not the only one, but at least the default that uh, the court system and the judges have uh, have obtained licenses for and thus are able to conduct hearings regularly. And it, it, from my understanding, it's it's been dozens of hearings so far, even just over the past couple of days, conducted entirely by video conference, uh, some of which include witnesses and exhibits. Uh, but what we're going to have to do is find a technology solution that works for everyone. And uh, everyone meaning uh, you may only have your cell phone, you may only have uh, a tablet to work with, and uh, whatever we're going to do for a, uh, a hearing is going to have to work on the environment uh, on systems like that. Uh, we're also all on our residential internet connections. Uh, what that means is that uh, we may have bandwidth issues, we may have technical issues that uh, we're not used to uh, when we've been in our offices you know, in the past with dedicated uh, landline or, or VoIP telephone conference systems that, uh, that work with a IT manager who's uh, overseeing and running the video conferences. Uh, it, it also means that things are going to go wrong and we're going to have to adapt and, and what we're going to talk about today are, are how to avoid and minimize some of those issues. Next slide, please. So uh, the things you lose when you're not in court uh, is essentially and primarily the, uh, the loss of nonverbal communication. Uh, you may not realize uh, how much has been uh, occurs without you talking in a courtroom. Uh, as an attorney, uh, you do all sorts of things, such as uh, watch the reaction of the judge, watch the reaction of opposing counsel. Uh, if there's a witness involved, obviously there's a lot of nonverbal communication going on there. Uh, all of that is lost when you are no longer in person and you're on a telephone. Uh, what that means if you're making an argument is that uh, you may not be able to do the most important thing that you should be doing when you're in court, which is know when to sit down and shut up. Uh, you may have already won the argument and by continuing to argue, uh, you're only making things less likely that you're going to win. Uh, if you can't see the judge's reaction and sense that, uh, then, then you may not be able to uh, um, uh, to follow that good practice. Uh, one of the things that we do at our firm in, in our training of our young associates uh, is that we actually have a uh, oral advocacy uh, training where we bring in former actors and, and actor coaches and we teach people uh, stand up oral advocacy uh, through some non-conventional means. And that, uh, that Although there are some uh, some things that are taught that are related solely to your voice, such as your cadence uh, and you know, storytelling using your voice, 
A lot of it is, is actually uh, how to stand, uh, gestures, how to paint a picture with your hands. Uh, those kinds of things aren't there when you're on a teleconference. Uh, so one of the things that will be an issue going forward and, and judges and attorneys should consider is uh, the use of video conference uh, because that brings some of that, uh, that nonverbal communication back into play and it will allow you to, to get a better connection with the, uh, the audience that you're trying to convince. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, so let's talk about the two components of remote advocacy. Uh, as I mentioned, audio, your voice, uh, and the visual, uh, your, your facial reactions, your hand gestures, and, and, and also the uh, demonstratives and exhibits and documents that you may want to present. Uh, we, as, as attorneys, uh, are used to the idea of audio only hearings uh, through teleconferences. In the past, uh, they've, where they've happened, they've been limited simply to uh, non-substantive hearings or, or emergency only hearings. Uh, a lot of courts have begun to adopt uh, Rule 16 case management conferences for example, uh, being conducted purely over telephone. It, it makes sense in that case because the, um, uh, the issues are typically administrative and there's usually not any kind of advocacy or argument that needs to occur. Uh, that, that can occur over a conventional teleconference bridge and we can continue to do that. Uh, one issue to note is that it's becoming more unreliable uh, because of the volume of business that's being conducted by telephone and through these teleconferencing systems these days. Uh, one thing to, to, to attempt uh, as you're going forward is not to try to hold uh, conferences on the hour uh, because one of the, uh, the frail points of, of these teleconference systems is the call connecting. Uh, so it's a good idea when uh, scheduling a hearing to ensure that participants are not dialing in on the hour, but to have them dial in five or 10 minutes in advance uh, in, in order to avoid those technical ish, uh, issues. Um, but you lose, uh, you lose a lot with just audio hearings. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we may need visual for is issues of substance. Uh, markman hearings, if you're a patent attorney, dispositive motions, for example, uh, oral arguments and appeal, uh, or at the uh, patent office for post-grant proceedings. Uh, those, those are going to involve a lot more advocacy, and they're going to involve uh, more documents, more demonstratives. And although some of that can be done just purely by audio and uh, advanced distribution of materials, uh, teleconferences are starting to be, uh, video conferences are starting to be used. And it would be a good idea uh, to try to do that uh, in these kinds of hearings. Uh, one, on the uh, slide here, you, there's a uh, screen capture of some ongoing oral arguments that the North Ninth Circuit has already done. Uh, they've held several so far. And you can see that these are uh, video conferences with uh, judges and advocates uh, in their home. And, uh, and there's been some different ways that they've approached it. Uh, the, the attorneys I've seen at these oral arguments, some of them are sitting at their computer, like the one here at their desk. Others have set up mock court, courtrooms uh, and a podium as, as the way that they're gonna present on screen. And it's kind of interesting to see the difference uh, in approaches. Uh, but more, uh, more technology like this becomes more complicated and uh, different kinds of issues are going to arise. Next slide, please. Uh, now I'd like to, uh, to introduce Jacob Ben Ezra, who's gonna take it from here. Hey everybody, uh, thank you, David. So we talked about video, uh, the video component, and that being one of the choices that you have to make uh, with regard to advocating well on behalf of your clients. And uh, as David explained, uh, there, there's a very real need for, for the video uh, or visual component to get your point across and to um, have the judge potentially better understand your argument. And so um, 
the options, which I'll get to in the next slide, uh, for, for making that happen are, are fortunately readily available and, and are being used uh, more and more often as we speak and as we've likely already experienced or, um, or, or at least heard about. Um, of course, there are certain times when you absolutely need to have uh, the video component, which is when you need to show a slide deck or a PowerPoint, for example, in a Markman hearing um, or any hearing of substance, and when you need to show exhibits or demonstratives. And um, and as David said, and if I just touched on, you know, as it says here, you just need, sometimes you just need to be able to see each other's facial expression. But even that's imperfect because it may be out of sync and so you can't really rely on that either. So you've got to improvise and do your best and listen to audio cues. And I mean, in the end, as you know or will find out, it isn't perfect and you've got to do the best you can do. And we hope that all the attorneys on both sides of the virtual uh, aisle and, uh, and the judge understand and appreciate that. And so you've got a couple things to, to answer to yourself when you're deciding what to uh, how to get this done, including from a logistical perspective. So, so are you going to push for a video conference? Are you going to rely on just the uh, audio teleconference? And if you do go with uh, the video conference route, <clears throat> what all are you going to try to show? Just the slides and documents or, or the faces too? And uh, consistent with, with that thinking, you've got to figure out potentially if, if all the participants, including the judge, even have cameras. And does the judge agree to be to have his or her face be on camera? So, so there are a lot of questions to answer and figure out. But suffice it to say that the best way, uh, I think, to to advocate um, well, given the circumstances, on behalf of your client, is to do a video conference. But with that comes increased risk, of course. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. So as I said, you, you've got a choice. Um, with respect to technology and uh, including a choice how technology wise that visual is going to be made available on other participants screens be it the participants faces or a slide deck presentation or both and there are a multitude of options out there for example Microsoft Teams, Zoom, WebEx and GoToMeeting. Some of the solutions are free and it's worth mentioning with regard to Microsoft Teams for example that courts may already have Office 365 licenses that would offer additional features in the context of Teams. So that's something to think about. And maybe all of us by now have heard of Zoom as an option and it's becoming increasingly popular. And so that's, that's one that we'll talk more about uh, also. And I'll just note that interestingly, that the CARES Act, which you may have heard about, has, uh, has and has had a helpful impact on the courts in this regard with respect to teleconferencing and video conferencing. The courts have been funded uh, pursuant to this act to enhance their remote and video conferencing capabilities. The primary focus is on criminal proceedings, but civil litigations will also benefit. These solutions like Zoom, for example, typically allow for everyone's face to show up on camera and with regard to sharing content, provide functionality such that a single participant can be given control of the presentation at a given time and be the host or presenter. So in the context of a hearing, that means you could pass off the presenting or host role between the plaintiff and defendant, for example. The host or presenter can show what's being shown, I'm sorry, can share what's being shown on their personal computer so that all participants, including the judge and the law clerk and opposing counsel, can see what the presenter is sharing. An important point though, <clears throat> is that <laughs> care needs to be taken with respect to what you're sharing to the participants. This is a big deal, because um, things could, could go sideways. What I mean is, if, if you're not careful in what you select to share, you might accidentally show privileged information or, or something embarrassing. But I'll, I'll say again, even more importantly, <laughs> sharing privileged information. So, so let's talk a little bit more about that and, and how you can be careful in what you share. So you should know that the solutions that we've talked about, like Zoom, for example, typically provide the presenter or host with the option to share strictly what's on any particular screen, for example. So say you have two screens on your desk and you've opted to share one screen. 
That means whatever is showing on the non-shared screen will be will not be visible to anyone else. But on the flip side, that means absolutely anything that you're looking at on your shared screen will be shared to all participants. So with that in mind, you can keep your email inbox with privileged emails, for example, on the non-shared screen to avoid accidentally sharing privileged information. And do the same with your web browser, for example, just to avoid any embarrassment in case you're surfing, uh, I don't know what, um, Amazon for toilet paper, for example. Uh, you don't want folks to see that. So keep it on your non-shared screen. But the selection of which screen to share is just one option. And in fact, maybe you don't have two screens at your home set up. Maybe you have just one. Maybe it's your laptop. Well, fortunately, these solutions typically provide alternative uh, options for what you share. So, for example, you could share uh, a specific application or even a specific window within an application that's running on your machine. And I'll give an example. So say uh, you only want to share Adobe Acrobat windows and nothing else. You can absolutely do that. Or if you want to share a particular window of, of Adobe Acrobat, for example, you can do that too. So let's say you have Adobe running and you've got five different uh, windows of it open. You can select to share just one and that's all the participants will see. It's pretty simple and pretty intuitive to select what you want to share, but you need to be sure to practice it beforehand to avoid getting confused or bogged down during live hearing and to avoid embarrassment. So I'll, I'll say that again, and, and, and others here presenting today will say the same, but you've, you've just got to make sure to practice beforehand. Another important consideration is that the video solution should be readily available and easy to use. I don't know if y'all can hear this, by the way, of course, uh, on a day where we're presenting a webinar on remote advocacy and talking about how things can and will go wrong, there's someone uh, outside my house who is mowing the lawn. So if you can hear that, forgive me. Of course, it would happen now. That's how life works. And it's a great example of you know, things that can happen. But we adapt, we move on, and uh, we all get it. So... Um, I was saying another important consideration is that the solution be the video solution be readily available and easy to use. So you of course want to avoid having your participants be confused by the solution that's being used for conferencing and, and when they're confronted with new software they haven't used before and you combine that with not practicing with it ahead of time, that's a recipe for potential frustration all the way around. So I'll, I'll say again, uh, make sure you and you want to make sure the court um, and everyone practices with the solution in advance. I know you have limited control over that, but that's a message to everyone, not just you know certain groups. We all we're all in it together, and we should all endeavor to practice with the solution beforehand. Next slide, please. All right. So let's let's discuss some recommended best practices. <clears throat> As discussed, the more complicated scenario is a remote hearing where both audio and video are to be used. We'll use Zoom as an example solution to be used for such a hearing. Zoom provides the presenter or host with the ability to, to both share, for example, a PowerPoint presentation while also showing a camera view of your face and also showing other participants on camera all at the same time. And that's really what you're going for in the context of the video uh, conference or video hearing rather. Um, Tying back to what David was talking about and what I mentioned earlier, where ideally you want to be able to see uh, see others' reactions, and, and they, and out of fairness, it works both ways. They can see yours, including the judge seeing yours. So you want to see the judge's face and the law clerk's face. So um, Zoom, as an example, provides such functionality all the while, like I said, letting you share your screen to flip through a slide deck or demonstratives or exhibits, etc. And it also allows the role of the host to be passed, for example, in the hearing context from one counsel to the other during argument and rebuttal. Next slide, please. All right, so let's now walk through some specific best practices in, in advance of the hearing, okay? So that's the point here, in advance of the hearing. You want to be sure to send every single participant the audio and video access details the day before the hearing. You, you just need to make it happen. And this inclu includes the court, of course, um, including the judge, the law clerks, the court reporter, and to the extent needed, the courtroom deputy. 
And you might think, well, I can just send it to the law clerk and the law clerk will take care of the rest. And, and that absolutely makes sense. But just note that um, you might consider flagging in your email to the law clerk um, that you, know, you want to be on the same page, that the law clerk will distribute the access information to, to all relevant court personnel. Easy enough. Also, of course, send the access details to the participating attorneys as well and any witnesses. And this will also help provide all participants with sufficient time to install and test any software, which again, like I said, is important because folks should uh, absolutely endeavor to practice ahead of time. Next, uh, reach agreement with the other side regarding sending the court a copy of the slide deck and any other documents or exhibits the day before the hearing. If the court doesn't require it earlier, send those materials to opposing counsel at the same time or at least an hour before. Okay, that's a big one. And I know I said send it to opposing counsel at the same time, which a minute ago I said is the day before. Let's, let's talk about that. So the general practice in an in-person hearing, depending on the hearing, is to provide the court with a copy of your presentation just before the hearing or earlier and provide opposing counsel with a copy in person immediately before argument begins. Fine. But we need to think more about this process as it just needs to be tweaked in the context of a, uh, of a remote hearing where things are different. Um, so why? Well, as, a, as we've said before, in a remote hearing, we're having to rely increasingly on technology. And what does technology do at the worst time? Well, it, it can fail you. So we need to plan ahead for that. If you electronically send the court or opposing counsel your slide deck or exhibits just before the hearing, you risk the court or opposing counsel not being able to download the materials by the time of the hearing. And we've, we've heard of this happening. So as discussed, you just can't assume that every participant has a reliable, fast internet connection at all times. And consistent with that, at times like these, where the majority of internet users are working from home using their own internet providers, there's risk that those providers may become overloaded and, and hinder users' ability to access the internet. And you may have experienced that yourself already. Uh, and in fact, just before the, we started the webinar, my internet connection dropped out. Um, it hasn't done it uh, in a month, and it did it today of all days, of course. So we just need to plan ahead and we do what we can do. So again, I mentioned potentially sending the, the slides and, and, and hearing support materials to opposing counsel the day before, let's talk about some consideration. So as advocates, I'm sure we agree, we don't want to spill the beans by sending our supporting materials to the other side well in advance of the hearing. And I mean, that, that's a fair point. But we need to think about this more globally. This, this is the, sending in advance is the cost of minimizing risk, it's as simple as that. So you've got a decision to make. And, and how far you agree to send it in advance in exchange is a risk-based decision that you just need to make. Assuming it's up, it's up to the attorneys, that is. The, al the alternative, which is waiting to exchange slides and exhibits until just before the hearing, means you're now risking the court or law clerk or opposing counsel not being able to retrieve the materials in time for the hearing. And that means you're going to run into avoidable consequences like delaying or rescheduling the hearing. And I mean, as, as you would think, the court might not be happy about that. And the delay may be uh, very much so against your interest. And for hearings where the parties are likely to be using various exhibits to help avoid giving the other side too much advance notice of what's to come, which I know we're all <laughs> worried about, you can send over a larger set of exhibits than you ultimately will use so that it's not clear to them which, for example, three or four you'll ultimately use at the remote hearing. Uh, next slide, please. So for any documents, these are some additional tips, by the way, that we'll cover that are uh, just on top of what we've discussed so far. For any documents and exhibits to be used during the hearing, add a cover page so you can easily guide the court and opposing counsel to them during the hearing. And give them easily identifiable file names even, such that, uh, such as what you see on the slide as an example, where it says DX-1 underscore and the document name, so that it's easily identifiable by everybody participating. 
Um, alternatively, you can make an electronic notebook so that's very so that it's very organized and easily accessible by all participants. You want to make sure that every single page, every one, is uniquely identifiable by page number or page number, um, as it makes sense for that specific uh, document. <clears throat> you want to also make sure to include page numbers in your slide decks or presentations, and you want to make sure that the page numbers in those slide decks are legible. Oftentimes, we see that in slides, the page numbers are far too small and can't easily be read. And as I'm looking at our slide deck here, I wonder if we've taken our own advice. I'm looking at page 10, we can make it a little bigger. Um, so there you go, there's a live lesson right there. Uh, so now, I, I just spent the last minute listing a few action items you can do. Um, with respect to a hearing and, and it comes to a to a a main point, which is by doing the above, you've now prepared for a plan B in case the video component drops out, which is absolutely possible and you may have already experienced or, or heard about. And let me re reiterate that. So if you provided to the court and the other party your presentation materials in advance of the hearing and made them easily identifiable and provided page numbers or base numbers on everything, you're now easily able to guide the court to the slide or document or page number in case the video component of the remote hearing drops out. All right, next slide, please. Please, and I'll hand it off to Stephen. Thanks, Jacob. So what I'm going to discuss are some things that are unique to remote hearings uh, that you typically wouldn't have to deal with in an in-person hearing. And uh, the first point I'd like to make is that it's really important that you identify each slide or document before you discuss it. And you really want to do this and you want to do it every time. And it's one of those things that um, we emphasize because it is easy to say, but really hard to do in practice. And I know that many of uh, you on the phone may have been to a PTAB hearing for like an inter-parties review and there's usually one judge that is remote and they do ask you to announce each slide before you go to it and it's really honored in the breach and i think that i don't think i've been to a hearing yet where one of the judges didn't say at one point counsel please identify each slide when you turn to it <clears throat> including uh, to me i've been guilty of this as well and so it's important to remember in addition uh if you're on video, that's great. And if the judge is on the video camera, that's also really terrific. Um, it'll be interesting to see how many federal judges are willing to do that. We hope more than, than not, because that is really the value of video conferencing, right? It's not really to share the slides. It's to see the judge's expression and reaction as you make your argument. But if for whatever, whatever reason you can't see the judge's reaction, either because it's a telephonic hearing or because the video is unreliable, or maybe simply the judge is on video, but you can't really see what's going on, um, then I think the issue uh, is that you need to make sure that the judge is able to uh, provide uh, questions. And you don't want to just assume the judge is uh, following along when in fact the judge isn't. And so therefore, we would uh, really encourage you to pause at reasonable times in your argument and say, Your Honor, uh, let me just stop you for a moment. Do you have any questions? Uh, what you don't want to assume is that the judge has no questions. The judge is being polite and not interrupting you, and you're really not making the most time of your argument. And now, of course, if the judge says, counsel, uh, I have no questions, I'll let you know if I have any, you wouldn't want to keep interrupting your argument and asking the judge repeatedly, that would just annoy the judge. But unless instructed otherwise, our recommendation would be that you do in fact, uh, you know, periodically ask the judge if they have any questions, because uh, the whole point of the argument is for the judge. And if the judge doesn't uh, know what's going on, then it really serves no purpose. Finally, because you're on a remote and you're not in the same room, you can't assume that everyone is able to hear everyone else. And so if you're the one organizing the conference, it's really important that you start out by saying, uh, you know, 
okay, we're going to begin and can everyone hear, uh, and especially the court reporter. Uh, it's important for the court reporter to take down everything properly and don't overlook the court reporter. It's really important that they are able to hear. And we would emphasize that you should specifically ask the court reporter whether they can hear and specifically let the court reporter know that they should feel comfortable interrupting any attorney. I'm not sure we want to say they can definitely feel comfortable interrupting the judge, but at least they should be able to interrupt every attorney if they can't hear and say, oh, excuse me, I didn't quite get that. Could you repeat that? And I was, in fact, at a uh, telephonic hearing. Uh, it was uh, with a magistrate judge in Delaware, and the court reporter was uh, remote, and obviously all the attorneys were remote. And it turned out that the court reporter couldn't hear one of the attorneys. Now, I could barely hear the attorney either, but I thought it was my connection, so I didn't raise anything. Um, but when we got the transcript, it was an absolute mess. Uh, and clearly, if that's you talking, you don't want that to happen. And the court reporter felt uncomfortable raising the issue. All right, uh, next slide, please. Okay, and so now we are on slide 14. See, um, there's a good use of the practice we're recommending. Slide 14 for anyone who's following along. Uh, so remember, there is no sign-in sheet. And so it's because it's a video remote, there are two issues. One is you want to be knowledgeable about everyone else who's on the line. And so it may be helpful here uh, to ask the court whether the court intends to take a roll call or whether, in fact, you want the, uh, <laughs> was I just corrected about the slide we're on? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, I think it's 514. <laughs> In any case, you want to make sure the court is um, is able to know everyone who's going to speak, and therefore, you may want to ask the court whether they'll take a roll call, or you may want to ask the court whether the court would prefer that you take it. But it's important that all speakers be acknowledged. Uh, even on a video conference setting, uh, you've got little boxes, little people, and it may be unclear who is who. And therefore, we would recommend um, that everyone kind of announce themselves so that you can connect a speaker with a face on the camera. Uh, in addition, it would be a good practice to ask that the court announce everyone who's just on the line, even if not present in the video, uh, that would including law clerks and court reporters, and the same would go for the parties. Because it's a video conference, you're not sure everyone who's participating, and therefore, uh, you'll want to make sure that uh, you know you know everyone who is there. Okay, now while you're speaking, again we would recommend again because you're not live and it's not readily apparent that you always introduce yourself and the party that you're representing. And so, for example, you get up and speak, then it goes to opposing counsel, and then the judge says, "Well, now back to plaintiff. Do you have any questions?" I would not just assume that everyone's clear on who's speaking. So if I'm the plaintiff, I would want to get up again and say, uh, Your Honor, this is again Stephen Katz representing the plaintiff, and I have a few follow up points I'd like to make. And so every time you get up, you should be identifying yourself, similar to what you would do on a telephonic conference, or at least should be intending to do. Next, if you're not speaking, then of course you should be muted. Um, there could be a lot of background noise that could come into play, um, and you want to make sure that nobody um, is able to hear that background noise. It could be distracting or embarrassing. I don't know whether your kid runs into the room and just, uh, you know, spill juice on him or herself or your dog starts barking. You don't want these things to happen while you're not, um, while you're not speaking and while you don't have a role. And so, you should keep yourself muted, and that will also help uh, the proceedings proceed. Along with that line, um, if you notice that someone is speaking or should be speaking and isn't, and they're probably muted, then you should raise that point as well. And you should say, um, you know, I think that uh, you're muted. Um, I'm expecting opposing counsel to be speaking. I don't hear anything. Um, you know, that would just be common um, courtesy. Uh, finally, one other point we would recommend, I'm not sure it would be appropriate in every circumstance or if possible, but we would recommend that you consider 
having a hotline individual, preferably from your IT group, on hand starting the day before the hearing. Uh, right? We would recommend that you would have someone you provide when you provide the dial-in information for like the Zoom conference or Teams conference or WebEx, what have you, you also provide a phone number for this individual. So if anyone has trouble logging in, getting their system set up, there's someone they can call one point person. Uh, likewise, during the hearing, if someone drops out, is having difficulty, um, there's a number they can immediately call and then some action can be taken as far as getting them patched in in some systems. Because sometimes computers do really strange things and it's good just to be able to pick up the phone and call someone. All right, uh, next slide, please. And I believe we are now on slide uh, 13. Uh, yeah, so I was wrong, it was, it was 12, but the slide print was so small I couldn't read it. So yes, yeah, so we were on slide 12 and now we're on slide 13. Um, that was the so point I made, make, the, make them big. So there you go, live lesson. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, so the next thing I'd like to discuss briefly is how to handle witnesses and exhibits at a hearing. Um, and so, you know, a witness is you know, a little different than the attorneys because they typically will not be joining at the beginning, but you'll want them to join midway uh, through conference and that needs to be, uh, you know, handled. Uh, but obviously the witness, like anyone else, is going to be getting the same information uh, as far as the dial-in information and especially the backup information in case things fail. And you want to provide the witness, you know, with the exhibits in advance uh, and so the witness can have them for reference. Uh, I think it's very important that the witness have either uh, ideally paper copies in advance, if it's voluminous, maybe electronic copies but on a separate computer than that being used for the video conference. Um, and I you certainly don't want to rely on the um, document sharing capability of Zoom, for example, um, to um, walk a witness through their testimony. Uh, that would be kind of scary. So while, of course, you can have, you know, the documents up and use that capability, you want to make sure your witness, like the court, you know, has their own copies of the exhibits. Um, that's pretty important. Uh, one thing to keep in mind with um, witnesses and exhibits and this sort of hearings is people might wonder, is this even allowable? Can you call a witness uh, from home on a video conference? And the answer is uh, actually the federal rules do provide specifically this sort of flexibility. Specifically, Federal Rule of Civil Procedure, Rule 77, um, you know, provides that uh, you can, you know, may have a hearing, may be conducted outside of the district if everyone consents. The rules are in a negative, but that's what it's saying. So if everyone consents, uh, you can basically conduct a hearing outside the district, and I'm not quite sure if uh, a remote um, video hearing would be considered outside the district, but it seems plausible that if a witness is outside the district and the other side wants to cross-examine that witness, uh, that a good argument could be made that the hearing is effectively outside the district because the witness is not where the attorney is. Uh, but federal civil procedure allows that, assuming that everyone consents. The question remains is if someone objects to a, uh, li a live hearing over video conference with witnesses, what would happen then? And you know, uh, we'd have to follow up on that. Uh, I, I personally am not sure whether in fact that would be considered an out of district hearing or not. Uh, if anyone else on this call knows that they can chime in, but that probably is just a, a new one for, uh, for the books and we'll have to see how this all pans out. All right, if we go to the next slide, slide 14, please. Okay, um, so what do we do? So you've got a witness and you don't want the witness to uh, be at the hearing from the start, typically. If it's a fact witness, an expert witness, you might want um, just listening in from the start. A fact witness typically uh, would not be permitted to do that. So the witness should certainly be on standby. They should have already tested their system and made sure that they can log in properly uh, so they can get online. And then they should just be kind of sitting and waiting at home, just like they would be waiting on a bench outside the courtroom. Uh, when the 
time comes, you would uh, call them to the stand by asking the court for a brief recess. You would then either text them or, or call them or email them if they're already using up their phone line, some way to get a hold of them and say, okay, it's time to log in. Uh, once they log in, you would want to make sure that they can hear everyone and everyone can hear them. Uh, so you want to repeat that sort of procedure and then you're ready to begin. Um, and so you would then go back on the record and the witness would be you know, sworn in and the witness would be asked their questions. Uh, and when the witness is done, uh, the, you'd ask the judge to excuse the witness and then the witness can simply disconnect. Um, so the real key to dealing with witnesses is to make sure that they've already tested their system. What you don't want to happen is find that there's some technical reason they can't get connected to the courtroom. And so you absolutely want to make sure they can connect and then they should go into standby uh, or if they have connected properly, then you know disconnect and then reconnect when the time comes. And uh, with that, I will tune it, turn it over to Susan. Thank you. Thanks so much, Stephen. Um, if we go to the next slide. So my portion of the presentation, I think it's really just described as what can go wrong and what you do about it. Um, and so I'm going to talk first about technology and how technology can fail you and some backups that you might want to have in mind in order to try to minimize the disruption to your hearing if the technology does fail you. And then I'm gonna to talk to you about how, given that we're all working from home, um, you know, life can fail you in these days. I don't know if anyone could just hear that. Right as I started talking, my 10-year-old decided it was a really good time to crush some aluminum cans that she had just finished with um, and throw them in the garbage, which I appreciate she's picking up, but probably not the best timing on her part. So those are, that's kind of the, the ending of our presentation and I will talk through those issues. So first, um, our a best practices tip is you have to assume that your technology is going to fail. Um, you've got to assume that something is going to go wrong. Your internet connection is going to go out. Your cell phone is not going to sound as clear as you might like. Your dial-in is not going to work. Something is going to go wrong. So how can you minimize those possible failures? So first, we would advise that you, what we're calling layer the technology being used and don't rely on just one platform. So how can you possibly do that? So if you're using a technology like Zoom, which we've talked about quite a lot today, I believe the technology is the same if you use any other video conferencing platform. A lot of times there's an option of either being able to use your computer audio for the audio portion of the presentation, or you can use a dial-in. And so we strongly recommend using the built-in teleconference bridge that Zoom and other platforms have as opposed to the built-in computer audio. One, it's just clearer um, when you're talking on a telephone, particularly if you have a landline, but even on a cell phone in general, um, your, your voice is going to be clearer, your connection is going to be clearer if you're using that um, audio component on your phone as opposed to your computer. But perhaps more importantly, the computer audio is using, if you're using the audio on your computer, it's using the same communications path as the video portion of your hearing. And so if one part fails, the other part's gonna fail too. Or if your internet connection is, your internet connection is weak, both your audio or your video could be garbled. And so much better to have two different sources of connecting to the court so that you can ma minimize the um, chance of disruption. Um, another thing to do is having a backup plan. So you really want to make sure that you have a backup plan if the video, the audio, everything goes out, if Zoom completely fails you, if it's overloaded by too many people trying to get on the um, video conferencing platform at one time. And you know, we all do telephonic hearings. Those happen all the time. Um, not ideal for certain kinds of hearings like a Markman, 
um, or a serious evidentiary hearing, but we do them all the time. And so having a backup plan of using just your firm's normal telecommunications bridge um, is a good thing to do before the hearing. You want to talk to opposing counsel and make sure that you have come up with a backup plan long before the hearing starts and that everyone involved, including the court and any law clerks and court reporters, are aware of what that backup plan is in case your technology fails you. All right, if we could have the next slide, please. All right, so what else can go wrong? Well, human failure. You need to practice with whatever technology you're going to use before the hearing. Um, you don't want to wait and try the technology the first time right when the hearing starts or, or really even right before the hearing starts. Um, I, I know I've gotten several emails from some people this week um, who are trying to use Zoom for the first time, and it does take a little bit of setup time. Um, and so you want to make sure that you have all the software appropriately downloaded, that you know exactly how to work it, that you've practiced sharing whatever you're going to share on your screen if you need to do that, or how you want to see the video. Do you want to see everybody at once? Do you want to only see the person that's speaking? You want to make sure your own audio is clear. You want to make sure that your own connection works well enough so that if you are sharing your screen, that you um, are, know how to do that, know how to set the screen up so that everybody sees exactly what you want and not anything that you don't want. Um, and it may not just be you that gets to make those decisions. If you're doing a, you know, a hearing, you've got to work with opposing counsel to make sure that everybody is on the same page in terms of how all those pieces are going to work. And so we'd advise not just that you practice with the technology, but that you work with your own internal IT department if you have any issues, but also talk openly with open counsel, or with opposing counsel on how you're going to deal with any issues like screen sharing and things like that well before the hearing so that because the, you want to look professional when you get in front of the court. Um, and same thing if I was talking about sharing your screen, if you are going to share a screen and you are going to present a PowerPoint or a PDF that is evidence for your evidentiary hearing, or um, you're going to show an exhibit to a witness and you're going to be presenting that on your screen, you want to practice doing that. If it's a witness, you want to practice doing it with the witness so that everybody can see the same thing. If it's a PowerPoint, get a few of your associates to sit online with you for a few minutes and make sure that they can see the PowerPoint and that when you advance it, it actually advances for them. Um, another thing to think about, and, and this has been discussed a little bit um, over the course of the afternoon today, is think about not just is your audio clear, but what are you going to look like? on the screen. Think about, um, I had a video conference last week where I couldn't see one of the people um, because the sun was coming through funny from the window he was sitting near. Um, on another video conference, my neighbor decided to take out the garbage right outside the window right behind me. And so all the people I was talking to on my video conference got to see my neighbor in his shorts putting his garbage out. So think about where you are in your in your home? Do you want to move? Um, do you want to make sure your lighting is correct? Um, also, you may want to talk, another thing you want to talk with opposing counsel about is how you could change presenters. How can you um, make sure that that process goes smoothly? And perhaps you'd even practice that in advance with opposing counsel, just like you might in the courtroom practice switching back and forth from one laptop to another. Um, and finally, and this has been mentioned a few times, make sure you know how to mute in whatever platform you're using. Make sure you know how to mute the audio on your computer. Make sure you know how to mute the audio on your phone. Um, you want to make sure that you, um, you have figured all of that out well in advance. Um, next slide, please. All right, just a few other points on the technology and on practicing with it. Um, you want to make sure, I mentioned making sure everything's downloaded before. You also want to make sure that the version of whatever technology you're, you're using will support whatever it is you're trying to do. So Zoom, for example, the free version only provides up to 40 minutes of a video conference. And so um, depending on how many users you have, 
So you don't want to be cut off in the middle of your hour-long hearing at 40 minutes because you're using the free version of Zoom. So you want to make sure to check things like that. And again, your IT department can help you and make sure that you have the right version of whatever software you need to have. Um, you also want to make sure you have a solid internet connection. Um, so we recommend, if you can, using a wired ethernet connection instead of Wi-Fi. I know for a lot of people, myself included, that's not possible. So another option there is to have backups for your Wi-Fi. So for example, I travel a lot for work, or I did before this whole pandemic. Um, so I have a MiFi that I travel with all the time. There are also hotspots in the community where I live. So I have several backups. If my own wireless went out, I have several backups that I could use um, so that I could make sure that um, my internet connection was available to me at the time of the hearing. Um, and the last option I talked about being able to see my neighbor out the window the other day on my video conference, um, Zoom does provide some stock virtual backgrounds, um, or you can upload your own backgrounds. And so, you know, um, I believe one of my colleagues talked about this already. You could have a background that looks like a courtroom or, um, and you could stand at a podium if that's how you wanted to present. You could have a background that looks like a law office. It doesn't necessarily have to be your kitchen table or your living room um, that it looks like you're in front of when you're presenting to the court. It might make uh, things look a little bit more professional. So that's another sort of best practice for presenting to the court. Um, can I have the last slide, please? All right. And so the this is my uh, my last slide that I want to talk to you all about. And this really is as mentioned at the beginning. We're all in this together. This is going to be an imperfect process. The technology may fail, as I just talked about. Some For everybody, for somebody, somebody may need to reconnect. You really have to reach out to and work with opposing counsel to make sure that you have things set just like you want them um, before the hearing begins so that you can minimize the number of disruptions um, and I don't know about everybody on the phone. I certainly have found um, in the last few weeks, um, it's been a little bit easier working with opposing counsel. Everybody, I think, is is feeling the strain of what this is doing to all of our businesses. And so I think that people have been much more patient. And so I would advise everyone to take advantage of that. And then finally, um, hearings from home means hearings mixed with real life. And as I said at the outset of my part of the presentation, um, I have a 10-year-old. I also have an 8-year-old. So I am practicing law and teaching fourth and second grade uh, at the same time. And, you know, kids will be kids, pets will be pets, people are going to come in. Um, and I've got a tweet that I saw the other day from Tammy Duckworth, uh, which I think sort of made this, this made me feel much better about my own working from home life. Uh, and I, I leave it there for you all to read. But if Tammy Duckworth can talk about uh, going to the potty with her daughter in front of the entire Democratic caucus, um, the rest of us, I'm sure, can find ways to um, do hearings and other teleconferences with the court. Um, and any amount of embarrassment will be understood, I think, by everyone involved. Um, I see if, if anyone has any questions, um, please go ahead and submit them if you haven't done so already. Um, you are also more than welcome to contact any one of the four of us personally after the webinar. Um, this is uh, David. I, I ended. I realize it's the end of the hour, and uh, I want to take a moment to thank all of you for attending today's presentation. Uh, those of you who need to drop off, feel free to do so. Uh, a replay of the webinar, including the full question and answer session, will be posted on fr.fr.com. But we'll continue answering questions for those who have a few extra moments and would like to stay on. So, thanks again. Uh, please don't hesitate to contact us with any questions offline. Uh, so why don't we, uh, we've got a few questions here. Uh, the first one is, might you comment on the reception of judges using technology to conduct hearings remotely? Uh, so that's, uh, that is going to be an issue uh, for some courts. Uh, some, some judges actually might be living uh, remotely and rurally uh, at their home. At, and uh, you know, for example, the Eastern District of Texas 
Uh, some of those judges have ranches and that's where they are and there's not reliable internet connection. Uh, they may be working from a satellite. Uh, so, so that's not very good bandwidth for a video conferencing and that may not be an available option for that court. Uh, the, uh, the teleconference option may be the only uh, way to go for, the, for the, those judges. So this, David, uh, this is Susan. I'll just jump in real quick. Um, yeah. In Delaware, things have been, so I, I sit in our Delaware office and I practice quite a bit in Delaware. Um, things have been changing pretty fast around here. I think in general, the judges have been open to suggestion on how, whether judges will use video conferencing, teleconferencing, or some other method of communication um, for, for these hearings. Um, there was an order this morning that criminal proceedings could be done by video conference under the CARES Act, which I think either David or Jacob mentioned earlier. Um, I'm not aware yet of any video conferences being used for any civil hearings, but I do think the court is open to it and um, has been reaching out to parties for guidance on how they want to proceed. Great. Uh, another question, the, uh, there is a question about uh, this go-to webinar, for example, there's an option for a uh, phone call and there's an option for call me on some of their platforms. Uh, so my understanding, and, and my, my colleagues can correct me if I'm wrong, is that both of those options relate to the teleconference bridge that is part of the, uh, the video conferencing platform. So the phone call uh, option is for you to call the teleconference bridge directly. Uh, the call me option that I've seen on other systems is the same thing, it's just the system will call you, so you don't have to worry about dialing in and punching in the correct code. Um, the, uh, if you call in the telephone bridge, I, I, I don't recall if this was mentioned earlier, uh, most of the, if not all the major video conferencing platforms uh, sync it up, meaning you're, uh, when you're talking on the telephone, the video conference system is aware of who's talking and can uh, can uh, maybe display your video uh, prominently or, or identify who the speaker is. And if I can just add one thing to that. I have heard, I haven't tested out for myself, that where there is a dial-in number and a call me option, uh, that you want to use the call me option. That if, if the system calls you, I am told it is a better connection than if you call into the system at least on some systems. Great. All right. Uh, and then the next question is, uh, is a virtual background available for the free version of Zoom meeting? Uh, does anybody want to take that answer? It's Jacob. I'll jump in. So um, I actually haven't practiced with it myself yet, but I remember poking around and seeing that there are some uh, stock sort of backgrounds that you can use for free. I think one of them may have been uh, one that makes you look like you're in outer space. I wouldn't recommend that one, but there are some options. Do they really fit in the context of the hearing? I'm not sure, but it's pretty intuitive uh, to, to, to find them. Again, I remind you that uh, this functionality is subject to uh, your machine's uh, capabilities. Uh, so, so it'll tell you, I think, if, if your machine is not so capable. Otherwise, I think different, uh, like lawyer groups, um, attorney groups, are even making these available for download. So you might poke around there. Uh, if you're using Microsoft Teams and not Zoom, I believe they've released a new feature that actually blurs the background. Uh, so the background is entirely out of focus, but you're in focus, and it does that via software. Uh, so there's, uh, it doesn't look like you're on a green screen with a, with a different background. Instead, it looks like uh, just you uh, is in focus on the screen. Okay, I, I think that's all the questions that we have. Um, I appreciate everyone's time today, and uh, thank you for attending our webinar. We're gonna post an on-demand replay soon. Oh, actually, there's one more question. We'll get that one in. Um, all right, so our courts are doing telephonic trials this month. They are set for one hour. Uh, we have a problem in the past where if one party is talking, no one can interrupt them, including the judge. 
how would you handle this issue? Uh, so folks, uh, someone want to volunteer to answer that one? So this is Susan. That's certainly been an issue in telephonic hearings that I've had. In fact, I remember way back when I was clerking uh, 15 years ago. Now, um, my judge getting very frustrated even on telephonic, you know, status conferences when parties wouldn't pause long enough for him to get a word in edgewise. And I think to me, the, the best way to handle it, some of these, some of these remote technologies allow for people to you know, raise their hand or, or they allow chats in the background. I don't actually suggest that for a court hearing. It's great for a teleconference with a bunch of people, but not for a hearing. I really think all parties just have to take the time to pause. So that the judges can get in whatever questions they have so that objections can be made. I really don't know that there's any other better way to handle it, though. I don't know. Maybe my colleagues have a different suggestion. No, I, I think that's a limitation of what we're dealing with. Um, but I, I do want to comment that uh, in Texas, uh, the first court to jump on and use uh, a video conferencing platform have been the family law courts. I think this is what, uh, what your question is directed to you personally. Um, so they, their suggestion with the video conferencing is, uh, is that there's an opportunity to you know, wave your hand or raise your hand and, and visually and the judge can uh, either note that as an objection or allow you to, to get a word in um, without having to interrupt the other party. Uh, so I, I, if it's a teleconference, that's not an option, but that's one reason uh, that it might make sense for courts and parties to try to push for use of a video conference in, it, in an actual hearing like that. Okay, well, that's all the questions. Uh, so we're going to post an on-demand replay soon at fr.com. If you have any questions regarding CLE credit, please email fishes mcle team at mcle team at fr.com and uh, you can visit fr.com for more information thank you all for joining thank you everyone